Thank you. Uh, uh, thank you, Tamar. Uh, very nice meeting you, and thank you, uh, everyone, for attending tonight. Uh, thank you also, Tamar, for uh, establishing incontrovertibly that I'm back in Canada by referring to me as a cultural worker. Thank you. <laughs> Artists will, will do. Um, I just want to start with uh, uh, right away in terms of work. Uh, this was really the first piece I ever did as, a, as an artist. This is around the late 1970s. I, I shouldn't even say as an artist, as a student. And um, I was a science student. I, I graduated with an undergraduate in chemistry degree. But in my final year, I was actually quite interested uh, or, or haphazardly uh, introduced to the world of contemporary art, which I, I didn't know anything about. I'd never been to an art museum before that point. Um, even though, I guess, in, a, in my own way, I was interested in art because I was, uh, I was the official flora and fauna illustrator for the B uh, British Columbia Ministry of the Environment and uh, the Ministry of Agriculture. So at one time, for many years, I was very proud of boasting to friends that if you ever took a BC ferry from across the uh, Georgia Strait, you would actually, and, and the tourism guide, you'd see black bears and and hawks and so on of BC, and they would be ink drawn by me, right? Uh, unfortunately, I, don't, I didn't keep any of, <laughs> any of that stuff, and so on. And so, and then I also worked as a, as a sign painter uh, for all, all kinds of various shops, not far from the neighborhood where I grew up, so I'd paint, uh, you know, Jean's Grill, and there'd be a gigantic Salisbury steak with peas and mashed potatoes, and then I'd paint, you know, Monarch furniture, there'd be a great big Davenport, uh, that's Chesterfield, and, uh, and so on. So I did that kind of thing uh, uh, for, for a number of years. I, wasn't, I, I never considered it art because I never knew anything about art, right? But I think it was my way of uh, maybe uh, trying to approximate artistic endeavor in lieu of knowing anything about uh, this thing called the art world. And so when I, got, when I was introduced to art, I took this class and um, at uh, Simon Fraser, and uh, I was introduced to all kinds of things which shocked me at the time in terms of what could possibly uh, be defined as art, including performance art and, and identity-based art and uh, all kind of video art, male art, and so on. It was also at a time where you had a lot of um, uh, you know, um, uh, women's galleries, and there was debate in terms of uh, women's galleries uh, developing a criteria of its own because it, because it was so problematic to even engage in the dominant art world because it was so uh, subsumed in patriarchy and so on. And, and some of those arguments were, were, of course, that argument was very interesting, right? It's not that you can't just dismiss it, and that's why it's so vexing, right? And so it was in that kind of cauldron, uh, this kind of moment at the end of conceptual art, uh, and uh, you know the advent really of um, of the Reagan era that uh, that and the kind of return to capital you might say that um, I really developed uh, my early interest in formation in art and so I started experimenting in terms of all kinds of media which I, I, I previously I would never have considered as as even possibly uh, art and so I did performance pieces where I'd be drunk and and then I'd uh, you know, lock up the uh, board up, boarded up the uh, uh, the, gal the gallery space, studio space in which students w w uh, needed in order to make their work, and uh, and then they'd be hanging out outside, and uh, you know, 50, 45 minutes after classes to begin, and I'd be completely drunk, and I'd be swearing at them, you assholes, you fuckers, and you, and so on, <laughs> and, and so on, and. Uh, and they're, they're, and they don't, they're not sure what to do. I'm going, you're, you're, you bastard, you fuckers, and so on, <laughs> and so on. So I did a lot of different types of performances, and, they, and, and I realize now, in hindsight, they all had to do with the frame of the museum, the frame of display, the, 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 the uh, terminology of art, the performance of art, the operations of art, and so on. And this is the same period, 78, I did this as a student where, you know, I was introduced to minimal art, and I was kind of fascinated. I was, I was, I was, for whatever reasons, I was very drawn to the antithesis, uh, antithetical uh, exemplars of, of what I had, for a very long time, thought was, uh, thought was art. Right? So all this stuff was like uh, 
for, was uh, vexing me, but I was also vas uh, uh, fascinated by it. So I rented out furniture and made uh, minimal uh, sculptural forms out of furniture. And they kind of developed like this and so on. And, and all the while, I was also learning about uh, the art world as well, the art system. And uh, you know, um, I remember uh, a curator uh, from Europe at that time came to visit and saw this and said, so you're, you're, you're obviously making fun of people's tastes. And I said, I was not. I said, this is, this is something that my mother would have really loved. And she goes, oh, that's impossible, right? So, and I, I remember being a bit hurt by that because I thought, why would that be impossible? I was just being interested. I didn't know, I didn't, as I said, I didn't have a long background in terms of artistic experience and so on. But that was like a kind of uh, anecdotal uh, moment that, uh, uh, you know, I learned something about the sociological uh, uh, constituency of, of, of the art world. And then the guy that, oh, I guess we have to leave these lights on like this, huh? Okay. All right, okay. That's another piece I did in Grenoble. And, and so I worked in several channels of art. Um, uh, one channel being these furniture sculptures, another channel being uh, language and publicity forms of signs. And as I mentioned, I was a sign painter for a number of years, so uh, I was interested in this uh, conversion of, um, of, uh, you know, of, of the discourse of the, of the business sign that's on the street, the street sign, and converting it into you know, gibberish. You know? And I saw it as a... In a, I guess in the same terms as, as uh, you know, Lettrism or, or uh, you know, like uh, Apollinaire's uh, kind of conversion in terms of, uh, of the page into a kind of poetic language. So I did these sorts of things, all done exactly the same way as, uh, as science was. One-shot enamel, uh, rolling pin, uh, chalk, and you can see the grommets, same system at that time. And then uh, this is another channel, which, which I call Portrait Logos. This is probably the first work I did in the early 80s um, with, uh, called Zainab, Untitled Zainab. This is the old Canada Trust logo. And, and it's plexiglass, very shiny. It hangs like a tableau. It's about um, uh, three, uh, two and a half centimeters. Is that right? I should just go inches. I can't, I can't. <laughs> two inches deep. What is that? Is that three centimeters? Is that five? Okay, I can't remember. It took me a long time converting to uh, from Fahrenheit to Celsius as a kid. Now I'm going, now coming back here, it's hard. So, so and this is uh, called Untitled Keith, and that's the Channel 4 logo for WNBC in New York. So I did a lot of these sorts of things. It's quite, quite a brutal uh, kind of collation between uh, a studio shot picture. I, I hired out a studio photographer to take the pictures of this subject, Keith. And, uh, and the, uh, the paradox is, is that the more dynamic part is, is actually the abstract part. And so um, I tried to think about this as a, as, a, as a kind of a problem whereby that energy in terms of uh, dynamism being asymmetrical to the abstract part, which is embodied by you know, the four here, but it's also embodied by the fact that you know, in, in capitalism, that is actually a private entity. So it actually, even though it's not organic, it's, a, it's an entity and, uh, that you can sue, for example, and so on. So I tried to render it with, and there's a little bit of Frank Stella maybe, and I tried to render it uh, that disequilibrium a little bit more equal by shifting uh, uh, energy back to the portrait side. And so I started uh, personalizing, I started taking pictures and uh, of the families, I started personalizing the uh, logos. So this is the owner family, uh, Bjorn, and uh, I forget her name, <laughs> and, uh, and so on. And of course, you know, uh, owner is, you know, the father's last name and lots of uh, issues around that as well. So that's Steve. And, uh, you know, you start uh, getting uh, more and more shows, and you have opportunities to do things that you start out in your little studio 
right? So this is done in the Neu Gallery in, in Graz, in Austria. And uh, I, I continued push in, enlarging the works and also pushing the works in this kind of uh, uh, more e equal exchange between the text side and the uh, uh, image side. I didn't see the text side as, a, it, it, as, as somehow uh, just bifurcated from the image side. I didn't see it as separate, but in, intertwined or in a kind of perhaps looping system. And I started thinking about uh, you know, the pictorial uh, potential of text at the same time as the you know, discursive and textual uh, character of, of the picture. And so that means uh, there's kind of oscillation, right? Because that picture could have any number of possible captions. And just as the reverse is true, this could spawn any number of pictures and so on. So I was interested in that, that space of oscillation, that, that distance between um, image and, and caption, so to speak, right? Because it doesn't, it doesn't really capture, right? And, that's, and, and so on. So, and plus, it's complicated because it's about this person's interiority as well, right? So it, uh, uh, which is, you know, not easy to de depict, but but I wanted to express all these uh, dimensions in terms of in terms of this type of work. Oops. I was also interested in tackling subjects which were, uh, on an apparent level, maybe quite prosaic, and yet, uh, and you see it a lot. And this may sound a bit conservative to say, but you see it a lot in more. Um, historical museums, all kinds of subjects that's being dealt with, and like someone drinking potato soup or, and so on, and that, that forms the basis for work. And so I was trying to use the same ki kind of uh, uh, homage, you might say, to, to, uh, in terms of these types of works. It's also very important for me um, to, um, especially because I, I teach, and so, and, and every so often I, I still encounter a student who will come up to me and say, uh, I, I don't know what to say, as if they have nothing to say. And uh, I always say, uh, well, what did you, what, what happened this morning? And they say, oh, I took the subway in and, and walked it to campus, and I'd, I'd say, well, what, who did you see on the, on the subway? So, well, well, actually, one person is kind of interesting, right? and so on. And they were having a bit of a fight, and see, it seemed, and then they saw each other off. And I said, well, there you go. There's a piece you can talk about, right? So I think it's very important to uh, you know, um, not be afraid of just uh, you know, exploiting subjects that are very immediate to you on a very local level for art and so on, okay? R rather than to become uh, Tyrannized by this, poss by by the possibility that the work's not lofty enough in terms of ambition or something, in terms of content. So this work here would be uh, done on uh, aluminum, and it would be about, I guess it would be about nine feet across. So smaller in this image, here, but not that much smaller, and then about uh, maybe almost five feet high. And then they hang like paintings, right? They're quite heavy and, and they're all stage. Let me use all send pictures. When I did this piece, it was interesting, just another anecdote about sociology and the art system. Um, you know, some, some people have read this as, uh, you know, somehow being uh, funny about uh, employees of the month, right? I was an employee of the month, Burger Chef, <laughs> so, and I was really proud of being employee of the month, you know? Um, and so, and when I say that, right, it, it, uh, a lot of people, uh, or at least maybe less so now, but at that time when I was doing this, um, in the art world would say, uh, well, that can't be. How could you be proud of that? I mean, you're being exploited. And I said, 
probably I was minimum wage flipping <laughs> burgers for eight hours and uh, but I wanted to be employee of the month I wanted my picture up there you know that's really important and so you know it's, it's that ambiguity that I, I'm after because that's uh, I, I, I I'm quite uh, empathetic to you know the social economy of of uh, all kinds of people and uh, which I find the art world sometimes is a little bit ca uh, callous about or if it's a subject that deals with uh, exploited labor it's always done in a way that either heroizes the worker or or it says you know work is toil it's drudgery you know it's, it seems to be the two poles rather than uh, all the space that's in between it might be too didactic moralizing yeah. <laughs> I feel like I'm north of the border now, so as a cultural worker, I can frame it in terms of, uh, you know, this kind of language which uh, I can't in the States. Sorry? What? Oh, it's a, it's a joke. Oh, no, no, no. Have you been to the States? <laughs> There's lots of things you can't say there. <laughs> Oh, I think the audience here is probably a bit more receptive to it. No, I say the same thing in the States. But I think people here more understand that. More. So uh, we are Sacred Blade, uh, world's worst band. This was done uh, before the Vancouver turned into this big real estate uh, uh, Cauldron, early 90s. That view doesn't exist anymore. It's all condo towers. And so this work here, uh, Tracy Bond meets Pepe Pig. Uh, I designed the pig costume and had it stitched together. So, it doesn't, so Pepe's pizza does not exist. Everything's contrived in it and um, and it actually came about uh, uh, based on uh, a true experience I had I was sitting uh, in, fr in front of a coffee shop in, in Vancouver's West End and uh, the A&W root bear came waddling down this <laughs> came waddling down Demon Street handing out coupons you know like free fr fries or whatever and uh, I thought uh, just as he came in front of me um, a little girl who look, looked like Goldilocks ran out and grabbed and hugged the bear by the leg. And, he, and she said, and this is really <laughs> true, uh, she said, uh, I love you, A&W Root Bear. Right? <laughs> and uh, it was so perverse because, you know, what, but, but what, what interested me was not her affection for this character of nature, right? Which, you know, it's nice to be enchanted, and, uh, have an enchanted relationship with nature but that this in character of nature was basically a mascot for a burger company. So there was a kind of perversion or, uh, you know, uh, disabuse of that en enchanted potential, right? So I, that's what I wanted to do here. And I tried to complicate it by having it, uh, you know, mixed race and, and so on. And this was done in, uh, if anyone knows Vancouver, Vancouver's Lighthouse Park. And uh, I had so many people when I was doing this shoot saying, don't you dare touch that tree. It was, like, it was quite dangerous. People were up in arms, right? And like, so on. And um, very hard, uh, those in photography, I, I set up strobe lights throughout the forest to get, get that light. Because otherwise it's too dark. And uh, a woodcutter's wife uh, is my uh, uh, work about the British Columbia economy, right? And uh, uh, I consider myself an environmentalist, so I don't, I don't uh, agree with the way they uh, cut down a wholesale uh, old forest in BC and the clear cuts, which I think is an abomination. But I also wanted to make a work of art that was interesting and maybe more true in terms of the complexities involved in terms of that subject. And so, um, I'd been thinking about this subject for a long time, but then I, I found myself uh, in uh, Munich at the Alte Pinaka Tech and looking at, uh, you know, Adam and Eve by, uh, who is it? The elder and the younger. 
Uh, Kron uh, Kronach, yeah. Yeah, by Kronach, Kronach, yeah, Lucas Kronach. And um, I, I just have Trump on my mind, that's a problem. So, <laughs> yeah, the Lucas Kronach. And, you know, Adam and Eve. And, but I, but it, it occurred to me that this triangulation between the tree and, you know, with the serpent in it and Adam and Eve was, was like very Oedipal. It was like Freudian. Like one, one, you have to slay the tree somehow in order to survive and so on. And so I did this picture, right? And they're both holding on to instruments of destruction, the cigarette the, and so on and, and so on. So, and then um, a woodcutter's wife came from... Uh, you know, I was uh, reading this uh, book on uh, ch childhood uh, psychology by uh, Bruno Bettelheim, and uh, he had a chapter de devoted to uh, uh, Hansel and Gretel, and uh, so and and where she, he quotes, you know, uh, the first line of Hansel and Gretel, "Into the dark forest who lived a woodcutter and his wife," referring to the parents of Hansel and Gretel, and then I realized, wow, that's the title for this piece. Then I continued, oh, for some reason it's missing in the very bottom. It, I continued to make uh, furniture works. I made all kinds of work, furniture works, that, which I didn't show you. This is called Tower of Love Seats. It's just two really ratty uh, love seats stacked and pushed in the corner. It's, uh, it's actually uh, uh, kind of a, has pride of positioning in, in some major Chicago collector's home. And I was invited one time to his home for dinner, and there it was in the corner. It's very strange, you know. <laughs> All this kind of beautiful furniture, and this this thing in the corner. And uh, the work's out even bigger. It's like this is probably about ten feet by uh, almost six feet, maybe it's eleven feet. And uh, and this is called Rebecca Rosenberg sings Bye Bye Blackbird. And uh, so that's the that's the uh, the musical uh, notes, and, and you can see the words there. It's like a music sheet, Blackbird, Blackbird singing, all blues all day, the blues all day, and so on. And uh, I developed another channel of work which involves mirrors. So I'm interested in a lot of things that, uh, you know, when you work this way, it, especially when I started, it was still very much into, uh, there was still very much a, a, a kind of orthodoxy in terms of, you work down a stream, you, you find a problem, and you just mine it, and you keep at it uh, within that stream. So uh, I was kind of working uh, in many disparate streams, even though I felt they were intertwined. It's much more common and acceptable now. But, uh, so when I was doing this, people oh, God, you're jumping again, and so on. But now, after many years, uh, there seems to be some lucidity in terms of the very uh, disparate streams. And so these are photo mirrors specially designed mirrors where I, I collect up photographs. Um, they are uh, permanently adhered to uh, uh, underneath with a clip. You can't pull them out. And, the, and, and uh, you know, sort of like a, a, what do you call it, a, a, a record, right, of uh, memories, of souvenirs, and so on. And they would be kind of thoughtfully, uh, uh, randomly uh, placed, uh, sighted around the frame of the mirror. And I was thinking of, uh, you know, Painters like Jules Olitsky and so on, or, uh, or even early Michael Snow when he did some paintings in, in this relationship of trying to evacuate the, the expanse of the painting to the edge, but, but still trying to maintain some sort of relationality, some sort of a, a hierarchy of figure ground or, or, or something like that in terms of this moment of difference at the edge to the, to the, to the center, and so on. So, and these pictures, are, they all come from different people. But it didn't matter. If, once you start putting five or six pictures, it didn't matter the source. They become a set of possible mem memories of a possible subjectivity, a single subjectivity, or, and so on. So they, they were like that. And you'd come in, and of course, you're reflected in it. And the sizes were deliberate in the sense that when you stood about uh, more than a foot in front of the larger ones, you saw yourself at full scale. And, and the small ones, you saw your head and shoulders at full scale, uh, or at least in, in its complete, complete completeness. And then uh, the image text work continued to uh, develop uh, into this kind of repeated text. I was interested in this question of duration, trying to enhance the durational 
aspect of it. I guess I was influ influenced by Anne Hollander. She wrote this uh, book. I forget what it's called, but it influenced me. It was about uh, 17th century Dutch painting and about duration in, 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 in Flemish and Dutch painting and the techniques in terms of uh, trying to, and, and duration was, uh, she meant by duration, um, you know, um, the, the ability of the work to not only interpolate the viewer, but to actually make the viewer uh, lose sense of a, lose sense of immersion, lose sense of time, and, 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 and so that there's, there's a sense of duration within the picture, and so on. So I thought that was kind of interesting because, you know, that's easy to apply when, when filmically, but in terms of an image, and so, this, uh, that influenced me, and so I started thinking about this text where these moments where, uh, you know, text becomes a bit of a mantra. This kid's, you know, obviously run, uh, going to, uh, running an errand, but he doesn't, uh, he, he says, you know, mom, dad, I, I don't need a piece of paper. I'll remember it. So he's remembering it as he's walking along. And, and by, by repeating it or uh, by either repeat, repetition or variations, of the same words, then um, you know it's uh, the, the the depicted person is is testing his or her own um, uh, you know uh, s sense of being because it becomes totally ontological because because he or she's at the limits of expression, the limits of language, and so on, and so sh she as a subject starts dissolving in a funny way, and so I was thinking about these texts whereby you're reading it, but, but on the other hand, you can apprehend the text quite readily because, because you can see that there's many words. Optically, you can see that there are many words that are repeating. And so they function uh, almost like a circularly in the sense that you, circuitously, I should say, where you read it and then you go back and, and, and so on. So I, I was interested in this kind of uh, oscillation of your eye back and forth and so on, and each variation underlined her distress, and each moment you look at her distress, you look at the text. That's very Russo. So, hello, how are you? I'm, I'm fine. My name is Fung, and uh, and it repeats, right? Uh, is, he, is he taking a, an exam? Is he, for immigration purposes, for, we don't really know. Uh, uh, and, uh, and I was interested in this case here uh, of, um, you know, someone basically saying, this is who I am, my name is Fung, but Fung is, you know, is a Cantonese spelling for a Chinese name. And so he's not really Fung, or at least he is Fung, but he's also Fung, right? So he's also the Chinese uh, spelling of that as well. So, you know, he's not just Fung. He comes to Canada and he, he becomes Fung. So I was interested in those types of questions. This is like a 45 second shot. I told her not to breathe <laughs> for 45 seconds. And you see the Dalai Lama in the background. And my Vermeer picture, I guess. You know, I, I was interested in the, in the interior voice as well, right? But I guess the other thing I'm interested in is I can say, yeah, that's the interior voice for this guy but it's actually the viewer who's actually reading it. So there's another interior voice involved. There's a triangulation of voices. In fact, there's that guy's voice, there's your voice as well. And there's also my voice because I, I scripted it. So there's a confluence of voices. Can you guys actually see the bottom from that side? This probably blocks it off. <laughs> Very badly laid out room. So that's it, that's it. You're in pain, you're in pain. You're feeling pain. You're full of pain, that's it. You're full of pain. 
right? And, uh, and just to illustrate my pr uh, previous point, right, it's also my voice saying it because I'm directing, and that's why there's chalk marks right here. I'm telling him, right? <laughs> so it's like one of those uh, self-referential pieces. <laughs> right? And it's painful to see someone enact pain, right? So it's like there's, there's a constant kind of tautology going on. And uh, I was living in Vancouver then, and, uh, and I needed to move out of my studio. And so I called up Temporary Manpower, and uh, they sent me uh, Werner Beckman. And I said to Werner, I said, oh my god, you, you looked exactly like, he goes, you mean Max Beckman? Yeah, yeah, he was my uncle, right? And so I went, uh, wow, I, I need to do his, his work, right? And so it's, 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 it's premise on the uh, famous uh, auto portrait by Max Beckman that's in the Fogg Museum in Harvard uh, in Cambridge. And uh, except there he's wearing a smoking jacket, he's holding on to a cigar, right? And he looks a lot like Max Beckman. <laughs> but he lives in, he's become a Canuck, he lives in Vancouver, or lived in Vancouver. And it doesn't, you know, she could try her damnedest, her friend, the blonde friend, to try to persuade her friend that she's not ugly, but she'll never be persuaded. So that's, that's the interesting thing about photography, I guess, and a work of art, is that it freezes this one moment in a kind of constant loop, right? It's like, uh, it's like uh, you know, the roadrunner in Coyote. Coyote will never <laughs> get the roadrunner. Uh, road and so she'll never be persuaded. You know, it's funny, I, I realized uh, as I was going through my images, I, I deal uh, uh, quite reg regularly with death. And then I also did uh, these kinds of mirror pieces, twin mirror pieces, uh, one uh, just frosted etched in the middle uh, of each panel. They come as two panels. Uh, this gap here, uh, when you fill in the gap, it makes a complete uh, square. And the one says, uh, uh, I, I think I'm losing my mind. The other one says, am I really losing my mind? And I was actually thinking about moments, uh, at least for me, when I'm in front of a mirror and, I'm, and I find myself talking to myself. I don't mean necessarily vocally, but just in my head I'm talking to myself, usually in the morning. And, uh, and uh, how that moment of where you're talking to yourself is like so momentary and yet it's and yet there, there, there's po many, many shifts within that speech to oneself. And so that's how I solve these works. And I did this in uh, Vienna. It was, uh, it was during the time of the uh, Jörg Haider and the Freedom Party. And, uh, you know, really, uh, which is much more common now, especially in the age of uh, you know, what we're seeing in the election process south of the border. But York Hyder is really, uh, you know, um, uh, you know very, he passed away actually a couple of years ago, but he uh, was like a really uh, xenophobic, very right-wing uh, politician. Um, and uh, I, I actually, I, I was asked to do a small uh, poster for Vienna, and, uh, and so I came up with, uh, um, which picture, I can't remember, one picture, oh right, I came up with the picture with the, uh, this one, right, so, and that was the only thing, it was going to be, and they've been doing it every, every year for about 11 years at that point, uh, where a different artist was invited to do this poster, and the poster would just be in all the subway stations, right, there'd be like a few hundred posters in these specially slotted sites, uh, which everyone was familiar with at that time, that was, was, the, was for the artist, invited to do that. And uh, mine was uh, uh, 
to uh, mine was uh, disallowed. So, um, and so that was it became quite a bit of a contretemps. It wasn't something I anticipated. And then um, when it was disallowed, it was quite controversial. And the uh, uh, Vienna Kunsthalle, this is the old Kunsthalle building, said, why don't you do it five more or six more and do it <laughs> like that and so on. There's, there, I have a funny anecdote about this one, which is that um, uh, I was on ARD TV, and uh, no, not ORF TV, ARD is German, a, uh, ORF TV, and uh, it was live. And uh, I said, do you, do you want to tell me the question? No, 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 it's much more exciting, uh, you know, uh, interesting if you, you are, I surprise you with the questions and so on. And he's, he's all gung-ho, this reporter. And I said, okay. He goes, so we're going live now, so you have to be fluid and, and that sort of stuff. And so we went live, and he said, my first question, Mr. Obama, why did you decide to put yourself in your work? <laughs> right? And I turned around, I said, uh, that's not me. And he goes, cut, cut. <laughs> <laughs> so there, it was live, it was, there was about a 30 second delay. <laughs> so he didn't tell me that part. And then I uh, continue exploring this idea of an imagined subjectivity by, uh, by inventing these companies and but kind of imagining uh, you, uh, the, 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 uh, you know, the pro subjectivity of the proprietor behind it and so on. And, and if you've lived in East Vancouver, you know that you know, this is all over East Van, right? So I realized, uh, as I, the more I did, did, the more I realized I was doing a kind of theory of East Vancouver and so on. East Vancouver before uh, the bungalow uh, crossed a million dollars value. So I imagine this guy who, uh, you know, is worried about the Kashmir. Maybe he's from the Kashmir, and and uh, he's expressing something which is maybe a little bit problematic in terms of um, the codes of business. You, you know, you you don't want to offer political opinion uh, in a public context. All Power to the People uh, references the uh, famous uh, slogan of the Black Panthers. So say no to racism and homophobia, but yes to sexism, or something like that. So ich habe die Nase voll means uh, I have my nose full. Like, it's like in, in French, uh, you know, Johnny Johnny Assay or uh, Johnny, I uh, know, um, just rad la bol, you know, in French. I know everybody here speaks French, so because you're in Montreal. So it means, you know, he's basically had it, he's fed up. And so I wanted, uh, you know, the viewer to imagine uh, who is this person, Bauer, who run, has run this sausage company since 1965, and then that some point I've had it. And these are quite large, right? Uh, this is bit, the, what you see here in the screen is a bit larger than what they are, but not, not much larger. Uh, 
I was invited to uh, do something in a hutong in, in Beijing. Uh, the hutongs are the historical housing neighborhoods of Beijing, not far from the uh, Forbidden City, so in the heart of the city. And they're threatened. So the hutongs are threatened because of uh, gentrification, because of the land value being so valuable that you have um, it being torn down and uh, towers being built in its place. Right? There's a lot of corruption involved. You know, state officials are, or uh, would put up, uh, would demand that uh, Hutong's area districts of the Hutong would uh, were deemed uninhabitable, even though there was nothing wrong with them. They've been around for a thousand years, and uh, as a as an excuse to evict people, was very little recourse um, for justice, and um, and many very wealthy people, including a lot of expats, uh, have. Uh, reconfigured multiple hutongs into one spread, one home, and so on. So whereas maybe six or seven families lived in, uh, you know, a like number of hutong houses, now one expat or one family or whatever lives there. And so my, my work was for this gallery, which is located uh, in a shopping street in the hutong district. And I had this big image uh, stage called Coming Soon. So. But I was also interested in coming soon in terms of, coming soon in terms of, um, you know, a kind of miscegenation, let's say, coming soon. You're not supposed to use that word, I know. And so that's, it was like that, in the gallery. It's a very small gallery. Oh, oh. Uh, I did this mirror piece, this is way out of order, <laughs> um, in, uh, in Documenta uh, in uh, 2002, actually. And it's actually a mirror pavilion uh, in the, uh, uh, the uh, uh, Karlsau, Karlsau uh, Park of the, nearby the Lorangerie, which is a kind of Enlightenment uh, era uh, park. And so, you know, the symbol of the Enlightenment is the mirror, right? And so par excellence symbol. And so um, I, I wanted to, I created this kind of fun house inside, but uh, it's called Mirror Maze with 12 Signs of Depression. And when you go inside, it's like a fun house mirror. Um, and you can't quite, see, maybe you can. There's actually uh, 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 numbers with the 12 symptoms of depression. It's like from pop psychology. If you, if you suffer from any, if any of the majority of these 12 uh, statements ring true, like I feel I can't sleep, I, I have no friends, I feel like dying, I feel like whatever, then uh, you're probably in need of uh, a, a medical care and so on. So um, this is, and so what happened was people, because so many people, English was second language, they'd be reading it aloud inside, you know, I, I, I wish I was dead, and then they would, and then their head would, you'd hear a bonk, right, because everyone was hitting the mirrors. It, re it really worked really well, and so on. There's more of this. What the hell did you do that for? What the hell were you thinking? Yeah, said that to myself many times. <laughs> and, and the ideal viewing position is actually right in between. And when you stand right in between, if you're behind one foot, you disappear. You actually don't show up. That's, that's the other thing I should have mentioned. And, and there's a band of color on the side. Not sure what time it is. Uh, this I did for the Istanbul Biennale. Uh, it's called House of uh, Realization. And you walk down this corridor, and you can see this text is in Turkish and in English by uh, uh, Yunus Unre, who is a famous Sufi poet which he wrote in Arabic at the time. But, um, and it's about, uh, and, and, and refers to this house of realization. And he makes reference to, reference to the three major uh, religions, Judaism, Islam, Christianity, right? And of course, Turkey being right at the uh, juncture point between you know, Asia and, and Europe. And so this poem, which is quite famous, um, you know, it says, I, I, I live in the house of realization the 70,000 angels, the, and so on. It's quite uh, a poetic po and mystical poem. And the only w way you can actually properly read this is to actually uh, traverse the corridor. 
of this. And by the time you get to the very end, at the end there, and you can see there's a bundling of people there because the hallway narrows, and you have to go down another hallway. And then you have to go down another hallway. And at each end of the hallway, there's a, uh, there's a mirror. And then by the, by the time you do a full U, and, and, and uh, you find there's a portal, and you come in and you realize it's actually a one-way mirror the whole time. And so the people here have no idea that these people are, there's people that's looking at them. And um, it was super popular. Every time I've done it, it's been super popular. And, it's, and on the one hand, it's, it is about the, you know, the, the power of seeing and the power of being seen. So there is a kind of um, disequilibrium in terms of that power. But then on the other hand, you end up being inside anyways, and you have to traverse back out the same way. Right. And uh, it was a lot of fun. I remember a, a Dutch curator spent a lot of time there. And uh, I said, wow, what, you know, why, why are you here again? And he says, uh, you know, it's very, very rare to be able to just really study someone close, right? So, and I thought, yeah, that's true. Right? I mean, people would be putting on their lipstick, pulling up their flies, picking their nose. It was amazing, right? And so, you know, I'm, I'm interested in desire. Uh, you know, uh, this woman, uh, I think, conveys that she's working class or a worker. If you, you can't really see it in, 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 in a slightly muted uh, uh, projection, but she's got a huge scar here, scars on her leg. And, uh, you know, so she's, as they say in her French, au point de troisième age, right? So she's not young anymore, and so, but you all knew that because you're in Montreal. And so she, um, she finally saves up enough money, and she's, She's, she can't believe that she's in Paris. But it's this moment of, like, I can't believe I'm in Paris. That uh, there's a kind of suspension there, you know? Like, who is she at that moment? And so on, so. So this is a piece about a guy who's going a little bit daft. You know, he's a short order cook. He's Asian. His English is probably not that good. And all day he's going, okay, cheeseburger, okay, deluxe burger, okay, beef broccoli, okay, you know? And he's on a smoke break. And even during his smoke break, he's, he's reciting his orders. For those who are students, that's actually a phone booth. <laughs> yeah. People used to put money in those to talk to <laughs> someone. And again, these are all stage pictures. I wanted her jeans so tight that the other side of the jeans was completely split open and, and we had to put a piece of string to hold it together. It's like about this wide. And her, she, her panties were showing on the other side because I wanted those jeans. And, you know, something quite pathetic about it. It's very, I, I, this was actually based on, I was actually on a bus in Vancouver and, and I saw uh, a, a similar story unfolding and this young, um, girl, I guess, she was a teenager, and she, she, she's yelling, you, you don't love me, you're such a shit, you know, and so on. And, and you could tell that, or at least I read it as, you really don't want to lose this guy, even though the guy may be a shit. You don't want to lose the guy, but then on the other hand, you want, you're mad, and you're trying to tell her, tell him to, you know, yeah, tell him that you don't love me, and so on. And, and by doing that, it's going to make things maybe not better, and so on. So it's a bit of a discursive trap. And then I did uh, these sorts of things where they're just kind of like uh, made-up shop 
signs. And I was interested in the, the possibility of turnover in the sense that the you know, negation, the white parts is potential business or, or doomed businesses of the past, and that the parts that's not white could also turn white at any time, and that these uh, shops represent a kind of community, but perhaps a distressed community of a certain class. So here it's you know, mostly white uh, uh, flats, so it's not doing very well, this mini mall. And you can sort of see that there's, a, there's probably a Vietnamese demographic. Paris Bakery sells Vietnamese sandwiches. Hung Vuong is pho. And then yeah, Hong Phuc is Vietnamese restaurant. And, uh, and I was playing with the, you know, this interiority and uh, 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 this is another permutation. Uh, this is called from uh, the 12 steps from uh, the 12 steps of um, anger management. No, no, this is, this is the 12 steps in terms of the recovery from alcoholism. So, you know, these kinds of infographics in terms of step one, step two, and so on. And this is called From Infancy to Late Adulthood. This is uh, between rejection, fear, comfort, and acceptance. Interested in the kind of system of codification in terms of emotions. And then I also did this public art piece. I've been doing quite a few public art pieces. Uh, I like it because it's a different audience, different demand, uh, different challenges, but also uh, you can step away from the art system, uh, you know, from the art world. Um, and this is called Pi. This is also done in Vi uh, Vienna. It's the, it's the uh, permanent uh, in, in the Karlsplatz uh, subway interchange. So it's kind of like the Times Square, uh, you know, stations in New York the most important, and it's called pi, P, P I, and, uh, and, and then you have pi is equal to the formula, 3.14 and so on, and then you can see all these numbers, and it goes all the way to the end, and you see here what's red, there's a, there's a count up clock with the 10 ongoing numbers of pi, and it keeps moving forward, and so on. Um, this, they're not real mirrors, but they, this is a highly reflective uh, one-way glass, that is highly reflective, and so I discovered, uh, or at least an assistant discovered, that if you put a count-up clock with its red lights flush up to the back of a, that glass, it was clear as a bell. You could see the, see the light without seeing the actual, uh, you know, the instrument that held, held the light. And the, uh, the vitrine I designed as well, that was part of the work, uh, and it's just a, it's just a, um, a site for an archiving of all kinds of statistical books, like the Farmer's Almanac, the CIA Handbook, Th Thomas Malsuth, Statistics, Pythagoras, all sorts of things, and it gets renewed every year. And then, um, in addition to that uh, very long work, um, there's corridors that run off at either end of that, like a big uh, V, and obtuse V, and uh, there's these, uh, mirrors that used to be ads, and that's why they're, you know, they were all cited like that. And so I, 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 I replaced all the ads with uh, these count-up clocks with all these factoids. And this, me this it basically says, wer lebe in Wien or heute, meaning, uh, you know, the number of people in love today, right? And so some of them were funny, some of them uh, were not so funny, some of them were, uh, you know, num number of, uh, you know, children dying from mal malnourishment in the world today. Uh, and some of them were very slow, like the number of uh, half days uh, in Chernobyl before it becomes safe. It clicks once a day. And then others are incredibly fast. Uh, the amount of uh, uh, 
money spent in euros since January 1 on armaments. And that one is super fast. It just keeps going. And every year, I have a, a Skype conference with scientists in, in Austria from the various universities. And uh, we have a scrum, and then they, we update the count-up clocks. So they're like this. Right? And, and usually, this corridor is very busy. So this is just before the inauguration. And there it says, uh, uh, you know, number of schnitzels eaten in Vienna since January 1. And it's done in real time, or at least approximate to real time. So at dinner time, it moves like that. At around 2 AM, it barely moves, and so on. And that statistics uh, came from the Vienna, um, the Austrian Veal uh, Association. And what, what you don't see here is that it curves gently in a kind of a V like this. And so the, co the corridor on the other side curves as well. And, and at an ex halfway point on this side is another mirror. So between there and there, there's another one over here. And so what happens is when you go through it, uh, this corridor, you actually see yourself coming and you see yourself leaving. It's very odd, this, which I didn't anticipate. Women uh, said, uh, because this was uh, sponsored by the Wiener Linien, which is the uh, public transportation company. And, uh, and they said, well, women really prefer this now because uh, it's, they, they feel much safer. Because you can, see, you, know, you can see way down because of the curves and so on. And then I did this in, uh, in uh, Leiden, no, no, in Utrecht, in, in, in Holland. And uh, it's from the inauguration of this very troubled neighborhood of Utrecht, troubled because there's a lot of breaking and entry, wayward kids. And these kids were all from uh, Indonesia, Suriname, you know, former Dutch colonies and so on. Utrecht was the home base of the Dutch colonial office. And um, which only closed down um, in, in, in the, at the end, in the mid-1960s. And so um, they commissioned me to do something about this uh, troubled neighborhood. And they built this building, which is basically the community center. Right? They wanted some amenities for these kids and so on. And so I was interested in how these kids are really the children of the decolonized subjects who emigrated from Africa, from uh, former Dutch colonies to uh, a place like Utrecht. And so, and you know, the most important year in terms of decolonization, at least uh, optically on the map, was the year 1960. So by the end of 1960, you know, the color coding of Africa, for example, was completely transformed. And so I, I proposed something which was, uh, you know, not so unusual. It was a kind of a map of the world, except that um, this map is frozen uh, at the date of January 1, 1960. So if you come up to it, you can't see it here, but when you come up to it, you see it says French West Africa, you know, Dutch Suriname, you see, and so all the old map, you know, Yugo there's Yugoslavia, there's this Union of Soviet Socialist States, and so on. And, uh, you, you know, like, uh, you know, Union of South Africa, and so on. And on the ground, uh, uh, there's factoids in terms of the year 1960. You know, which film won the Academy Award? Queen Juliana opens, a, opens the uh, Tulip Festival in Utrecht in 1960. So uh, factoids that range from the local to the national to the international. And then I also did a series called um, uh, French Death in Western Canada. I don't know why. <laughs> Just kind of like this. I, I, I guess what happened was one day I was reading the uh, Vancouver Sun and looking at the obits, which I tend to do uh, for fun. And then uh, I, I saw two um, obituaries, and both of them were, uh, were of people who died in, West, in, in, you know, in BC, and both of them were French. And so then I decided to make it into a series. So, and these were painted uh, onto uh, wood. Oops. So here's an, one painting, Forget, Therese, Gabriel. And I, act, I actually scripted, I re-script the whole thing so it fits into the 
into the, um, you know, the, the dimensions. I'm almost done. Oh, there. Sorry. I'll just skip. I'll skip that. <laughs> Did that in Vancouver, obviously. <laughs> um, this is what I've been working on. Uh, uh, little clay heads of tragic Philadelphians. This, this is in my basement, <laughs> which I do in clay. I actually can do clay modeling uh, and of a certain size. And uh, because I live next to a guy. Uh, Albert Stubbs, who, who taught me how to sign, he was a sign painter, and he took me in as an apprentice, but he was actually an RCA grad in sculpture, and so he taught me how to play with clay and so on, wet clay, and so this is of a, a you know, a kid who was, uh, was the lone, one of the children who survived the move bombing in Philadelphia, you have to look that up, and this is uh, Nancy Spungen of Sid and Nancy from Philadelphia, killed by Sid Vicious. Um, this is a uh, Joey Stefano, who was known at the time in the 80s, uh, late 80s and early 90s as um, the George Clooney of the gay porn world. Uh, came from Philadelphia, died of uh, Hep C and uh, AIDS related at the age of 26. So Gia Karenga, who is the world's first supermodel from Philadelphia, who died of a speedball overdose at the age of 26. So I did a whole bunch of heads of just uh, tragic Philadelphians. Um, I'm not sure why, but I'm just doing it. And then uh, this is in Kansas. It's sometimes re furniture sculpture. Oops, I better hurry. This is I did at the Whitney Biennial. These are all. Um, it's like a Vietnamese, uh, not mini mall, but you know, larger area. It's all Vietnamese, but everything references the Vietnam War, right? And and it came about because I I live in South Philly, not far from a Vietnamese uh, shopping area. And, uh, and one day, I was, as I was actually eating my pho soup, there was a, there was a ceremony outside where you, you got all these former Vietnam vets and wearing their South Vietnamese uniforms and raising the uh, South Vietnamese flag and uh, pl singing the South Vietnamese anthem. It was quite, quite sad in a way because, you know, that doesn't exist anymore. And so here, everything refers to the uh, Vietnam War. So a club cherry is a cherry is someone who hadn't seen battle yet. Uh, uh, Fanti Kim Phuc is the napalm girl, right? Nung and Tay are minority peoples in Vietnam who, who were decimated during the war, um, and so on. So everything is like Bao Dai is a huge battle there with Marines. Uh, Chai Myung Shin was the general for South Korea. South Korea was a was on the American. Uh, side in terms of the uh, Civil War in Vietnam, and so on. So everything re refers to that Tet Offensive. Menzies was the uh, New Zealand Prime Minister who, who uh, approved of New Zealand troops for Vietnam, and so on. And Midway, right? That's when uh, President uh, Nixon met with President Thieu, uh, in, um, in on August 6, 1969, on Midway Island to talk about peace with the North Vietnamese. And these are my most recent works. Uh, uh, it's called, uh, a series called Necrology. And they're very big pictures of text which I design, which I script. And uh, they're basically a, a kind of a obituaries uh, from the local newspaper, Philadelphia Inquirer, and other sources um, in which I uh, rendered them like 19th century frontispieces. pieces. So in the same kind of language. So like the most unfortunate case of Lucy Chono Santos, convicted of smuggling heroin into Indonesia, whose mistake was to fall victim to a phony employment recruiter who fronted for an, an international drug gang and later threatened to kill Lucy's family if she refused to do as the gang demanded. Follow her story from growing up in a shanty on the edge of Manila, where she supported her parents and siblings by retrieving value from garbage to bearing a child at a tender age of whom she was separated for several years as she sat on death row awaiting execution by firing squad, passing her days in a squalid and overcrowded prison. 
to this is offered the particularities of her finality, including the many press stories, legal and diplomatic documents, and the many affecting and heartrending letters to her son, written a short time prior to her, her demise, all pressed from the originals of her own handwriting. For the Crusader, one woman saga, a story about the trials and tribulations of Beryl, mother and unassuming housewife living in the suburbs, herself born the happiest child who led a crusade for change after her son was killed in a terrible accident by a truck and was mis treated badly by insurance executives, government officials, and others of unscrupulous mind, whom she had deeply trusted only to fight for the way that truck wheels were designed such that they maintained their structural integrity rather than to explode. How she made the treacherous roads safer for countless others for which she won many accolades and much gratitude upon which she returned to her love of gardening, bridge playing, and bird watching and finally passed away from the ravages of Parkinson's disease. A recounting of the events and experiences in the life of Yasser Korshed with the means by which he acquired his courage and wisdom whose influence in the field of garment factory reform was felt here and abroad, the inequity of sweatshop conditions, a chronicle of a good person's untiring fight to win garment worker rights to sanitary working conditions, maternity and paid leave, a raise in the minimum wage, and a stop to the beating and sexual harassment of exploited laborers, including children for whom he fought hard for their protection until the last day of his life at the age of 34, dying from cancer due to Penzied exposure. This I did in Vancouver. It's about a one-third scale house. So I, oops, I'm missing some images. Oh, okay. Um, I, just to uh, cap it off, just showing you some projects I was involved in. I was the research manager for this. I had spent a lot of time in West Africa, namely Dakar, visiting Ouagadougou, uh, you know, Bamako, and places like that. Um, and, and, and visiting all the archives uh, of these countries, especially around the time of, uh, especially in the files relating to uh, Charles de Gaulle's beseeching of, of uh, then colonial uh, West French Africa to stay within the bosom of France. So I, I, I kind of managed the research uh, of a whole group of people for this amazing show that was curated by Okfi and Weiser. And then I, I was co-curator of Shanghai Modern so I spent a lot of time throughout uh, China, actually, and uh, uh, trying to uh, recover a lot of old art uh, of Storm Society painters and so on. Uh, I found one Storm Society painting um, uh, by uh, Bing Wang, and, uh, which, and they, they represent a kind of like a Ur moment in terms of contemporary art in China today, during the Republican period of China. And uh, I remember at the time talking to my co-curator, uh, Zheng Chen Tian, saying, you know, we should actually buy this stuff. This stuff's like so cheap. And this is, and, and I, we weren't thinking of, as speculators, we were thinking we should just buy it and then kind of salvage it because we were, they, were, they were damaged. And we, 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 the Museum Villa Stuck in Germany basically repaired everything. And then, and then Jung said, Dr. Jung said, no, no, that would be too unethical. And so I agreed, right? So we didn't buy it. And then uh, four years ago, I was in Hong Kong, Christie's auction, happened to be in Hong Kong, and that one painting that I, recovered that I found, right, was, on, uh, was up for auction and sold for two million US dollars to a Taiwanese collector whom I had dinner with afterwards and I said, you know, I found, he goes, yes, I know and I appreciate it. <laughs> and then I also co-curated the Sharjah Biennale 7. So that's the shake, the huge uh, nose. And I'm working on, this is the first iteration of a project for Philadelphia called Monument Lab, uh, which, uh, which is a $3 million uh, but, uh, uh, project and uh, that deals with the negative histories of, of Philadelphia. And uh, this is just the poster for the first iteration, but the next iteration will be much bigger throughout the city. So I'm happy to entertain any questions. I'm sorry for running on so long. Thanks a lot, Ken. Just give us a second. We'll yeah. run a mic around so that we can record the questions. Photo historians in the room. Yeah. 
Contemporary yeah. art history, Canadian art history. This is an embarrassing <laughs> question, Jen. May I ask you an embarrassing question? Okay. Um, hi. Um, so, you were when you were showing the earlier, the earliest photo work. I think that you were. I think you said that you were working with portrait photographers. Mm -hmm. Very yeah. early ones, yeah. Very early. What was the shift? What, at what moment did you start uh, staging and doing them all yourself? Was that just a realization that you could? Or? No, I, I, I tried to allude to that, which was uh, I was dissatisfied with this disequilibrium. People are going, wow. The I realized that there's so much energy in terms of the corporatist logo side mm -hmm. at the expense of the human depicted side. Mm -hmm. And so I thought, well, how, how do I make it more balanced? Because I'm interested in this subject. I'm not so interested in the company, right? Mm -hmm. And so I thought one way to do that was to, was to gain control, more control. So that's when I started taking my own pictures. Okay, Tim. I talk a lot, so that's why you know, I kind of answer my own qu questions. The, um, my question is, is based on a premise which I'll first ask if you agree with. Do you agree that the phenomenon of the peripatetic transnational wandering artist from Biennale to Biennale is a phenomenon of the last, say, two decades? And if so, what do you think that phenomenon uh, reflects, if you wish? Well, of course I agree, because it's a fact. Yeah. Right? And so, uh, what does that phenomena reflect? On the one hand, I guess it reflects the uh, global interest in art, right? At one level. Uh, you know, when you think back to, uh, like, 92, really, the document 11, right? Or maybe even before that with the Magician de la Terre exhibition, which is, like, 1989. Yeah. 89 being a really crucial year, because 89 was when Apartheid ended, right? Uh, China, uh, there was the uh, uh, Tiananmen, right? There was also, 89 was uh, the, uh, the Berlin Wall, right? And so on, and, and you know, art markets kind of went into those areas very quickly, right? The advent of, and so, um, the Biennale form, I would say, uh, the way I would answer is that the Biennale form is a kind of interesting form uh, maybe it's getting less interesting, but at that time it was very interesting because it was the only way, it was the best way in which uh, contemporary art could be uh, staged in a way, in these places like Istanbul and so on, where you, you, where you had the dearth of galleries and museum of contemporary art. This is before museums and so on were kind of proliferated again, you know, uh, like in China, right? The Shanghai Biennale started right in 1998 there was no contemporary art museum in China at that time, right? So the Biennale form was a very interesting form in which local voices, right, could, could speak out through art. And it was very interesting. A lot of good, good artists emerged out of these Biennales, right? Now, I, I, if, if it's about, well, what's, has that become a kind of professionalized procedure in terms of the career of many artists? Yes, I mean, there are, there are artists who you could say are Biennale artists, right? And, and, and so in the sense that they, their work is suitable for that format. But I think that also does a disservice to, to, the, uh, to the kind of uh, richness of the, uh, of the Biennale form when it first emerged, right? I, I know that, you know, the Venice Biennale has been around for a while and the Sao Paulo and Havana, right? But, you know, every year, year through, especially through the 90s, there was like this growth in terms of, in terms of these biennales, uh, in places that were, you never had contemporary art before, right? And it was very interesting, right? A lot of good art came out of those areas. Now, is there a rapacity of the art market to territorialize those areas and, and syndicate it within the, within the logic of, you know, the marché de l'art? Of course, that happened, right? The kind of acculturative process of, of the art market. And it's, uh, it's always the kind of tragedy of art, I think, to a degree. And that's why, at some point, I can't r hack or handle that non-identity problem. It's like a Hegelian non-identity problem between art and the, ide the ideals of art and the reality that's called the art world. And that's why I, 
I do these other projects, right? You know, because you know, every one of these projects take up a lot of time, a lot of work. I mean, I had to write you know, a 10,000 word essay for the Shanghai Modern. I had to do a lot of research, you know? The Sharjah Biennale, I had to write the key essay, right? And so I don't do it because I like it, right? I do it because I always <laughs> ask myself, I ask myself the question, is, there, is this all there is to art, right? I live in Philadelphia and I can go up to Chelsea anytime. It takes only an hour to get there. And, and I go through the galleries, but at some point it's also fatiguing too. You know, every so often it's, it's okay, it's interesting, but just something, especially in this age of super syndicated galleries, it's really quite despairing at some point. And I, I, and I felt liberated when I felt that I could say, I, I can step back from it if I, if I want, right? So I engage in public art and I, I do a lot of writing, I curating and so on. Thank you. Robert Graham, who's, uh, you know, his work from uh, the Los Angeles Olympics, Robert Graham's great, great stuff, figurative work. <laughs> I'm sure. <laughs> and uh, the Joel Lewis Fist, Detroit, Robert Graham. Brett Barmby, a painter from the MFA <laughs> program here. <in laughs> uh, hi. Um, I know you have a lot of different uh, projects going on, like the mirrors, the signs, the couch projects. Uh, but one of my first introductions to your work was uh, your performance where you stood on the highway leading into Surrey. Mm. And I'm just wondering um, why uh, only in early in your career there were performative works and when you decide to shift away more into image making. Well, uh, <laughs> performance was, uh, was something which was, the, was, was diametrically opposed to my conceptions of art at that time. And, uh, but I... But it's also, you know, performance isn't that, I mean, it's recorded now, and now it's become almost like cult-like, right? People always reference it, but, um, but it's not, but I also, I also like being part of the gallery system in a way, right? There's, that was an advantage it, it, uh, uh, of art. It's framed as art and so on. And at that time, to do a performance out there, you're really, uh, you know, bef in, in, before the point of actually establishing a, a language of your own work, you know, there's some, there's a lot of confusion, and of course that confusion is, is what is also appealing <laughs> to me now, but at that time, it was also um, a kind of confusion that I, I, I wasn't, I didn't think was so interesting for me in terms of building work, because the confusion is, it, it relates to, uh, is it art or is it non-art? And so on. So, um, yeah. So once I did a few performances, I, I just moved on. I think Brett's moving in the other direction, from <laughs> painting into performance with paintings. No. <laughs> yeah. Uh, when you show us your art, you, it seems that there's a lot of. It doesn't seem to work, but uh, it seems. No, no, it no. works with the camera. It works oh, okay. for the camera. It seems uh, there is like a lot of uh, your topic are seems really happy, like uh, with the, that humans qu questioning himself and stuff. But at the end, you show us some uh, project that are more a little bit more deep, like talking about dead, dead. Uh, people and I'm wondering why that l drastical like uh, changing of uh, the way you uh, you seems to is it like because you're interesting in time and that everything's uh, living is finishing dead or s mm. well maybe uh, I don't know how to answer that other than that I guess I'm, I'm getting older so I'm getting close to my, closer to my own death, right? And I think about death every day. I do. I wake up and throughout the day I think about death, right? Not, not specific death. I just think about death a lot, right? And so, um, and I think it's good to think about death, you know, and so on. And I have children too, and so when you have children, uh, you know, you think about your own demise, but you also think about, oh, God, I wish I could live forever so I could be with my children the whole time. So it's this terrible dialectic, and so on. Uh, 
but I also think, uh, you know, that's just the way my work developed, right? I, 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 I get, get more, like you said, it's becoming more deep, and, I'm, and so I don't know how to answer that, 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 that I, I wanted the work to be more deep, <laughs> right? <laughs> and so on. But I'm interested in lots of things. I'm interested in, like, you know, the, you know, the uh, distribution of the uh, sensible, like right? Rossier, right? That, I'm sure you've read that, right? Those, those ideas were, you know, it's very, it's very aesthetic theory, right? Because it's all about things that you actually can see or discern, not necessarily visually see, but discern, right? And, 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 and all the things that are discernible is meant to reproduce the relations of, reproduct of the productive system, right? That was, an, that was an idea he developed from his teacher, Althusser, right? I'm interested in all that kind of stuff. And the more you read that stuff, and I, I kind of read that stuff for, as a hobby, really, Right? I read that stuff all the time, and, and believe me, you get really down. <laughs> right? You cheer up with the obituaries? Yeah. <laughs> uh, you said that looking back over uh, all your work, you were preoccupied with the theme. You can ask another question mm -hmm. about death, I guess, mm -hmm. but it's a good one. How is the early work dealing with that theme, and then maybe we'll take a question afterwards, so we don't end with a question. Well, I don't know whether uh, it, I think all the works deal with imagined subjectivity, mm -hmm. and so they all deal with life and death, right? They all deal with someone, you know, and 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 of course, trauma and consternation and tribulation and trial. That's always more interesting than uh, jet setter, you know, never had a, to work in his life or her life. It's always more interesting than that. Mm. Tolstoy said, happy families are all the same. Mm. The unhappy <laughs> ones are interesting. Hi, um, I have a question about uh, uh, the context that some of the, the works get viewed in. Like at the very end of the lecture, you showed a, a, a picture with the, the billboards, and you said, this is somewhere in Kansas, I think, mm -hmm. is what you said. Um, and I was wondering if, like, uh, they're always viewed in that format, like, as billboards or, like, uh, just the different manifestations of those works, because it was just so, so different seeing it in the context of, like, mm -hmm. you know, this space and then in the billboard and, and you know, in Kansas, like, mm -hmm. what, how do, I'm curious how, like, the populations react to those works, you know, because mm -hmm. they, they, they blend in as, so well as advertisements mm -hmm. in those contexts, but at the same time, they're like so obviously like this sort of alien entity, yeah. you know? And also, I was wondering if the mini mall signs, like if you've had some of the same interventions with those or not. Well, I'm, 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 I'm obviously because of the kind of graphic nature and the way they, 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 they're composed, my, my work, they lend themselves to graphic reproduction, and right? So that means that they can, can facilitate transposition to a different surfaces. Right, and so on, and, and 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 different reception, right, and so on, and they disrupt perhaps different contexts in a different ways, right? Audiences are different, so I'm I'm well aware of that, right? And for a long time I resisted that and, and was happy to have it confined within gallery spaces, but now I'm uh, now I think that was probably stupid, and I realize it's actually interesting to try to uh, uh, broaden out, um, and I'm interested in, in the question of, um, uh, of uh, you know, the, the, the limits of what is art and what is non-art. Uh, I want it to be art, but I also want the, uh, to be some sort of moment of deferral in terms of its rec possible recognition that it could plausibly be non-art, however momentary. And in that moment where there's uh, misrecognition before it's framed as art, or announces itself to the viewer as art, uh, I think a lot of things happen. I'm very interested in, in that effect. Maybe we'll take one more. Sure. Hi, Kim. Uh, I've, there was a lot of hearsay going around when you started to do the uh, staged imagery. Um, what's your story in, in relation to Jeff Wall? What's my story? Yeah, because there was a lot of, lot of projection, a lot, like just gossip. But I wanted to know, from your point of view, <laughs> were you influenced? Were you uh, not influenced? It's, it's actually very simple. Uh, uh, 
I'm nothing and he made me. <laughs> so, does that answer the question? I don't believe you. <laughs> And Ken will be making some students, lucky MFA mm -hmm. students, uh, in the department tomorrow. Uh, he's doing yep. studio visits. He's very generously agreed to do that. Um, we'll give him a break. For very little pay, by the way, <laughs> <laughs> because, because I know you're dean. <laughs> <laughs> Just do the conversion to US. <laughs> Let's get you some dinner yeah, sure. and rest up before tomorrow. Uh, thanks very much, everyone, for coming. And thank you so much, Ken, thanks. for the talk.